All righty. Well, uh, so nice to uh, be here finally. And uh, once again, apologies for missing a couple dates uh, for this go round. Uh, you may or may not know that uh, two weeks ago I took a fall skiing and uh, fractured my pelvis. So I have, a, I guess, a good excuse. Um, yeah. And uh, thankfully, as far as pelvic fractures go, I have the low end of the pelvic fracture scale that they can get a heck of a lot worse. So hopefully I'll be back on my ice tools and skis within uh, a month. Um, yeah, I'll just mention that uh, this is the last episode of uh, uh, the uh, Greatest Alpine First Ascents, 1983 to 2002. And uh, yeah, they're all available on uh, Yamneska Mountain Adventures Facebook page. Uh, if you just go to the videos box and uh, you'll find a bunch of videos there that you can just bring up and, and start watching. So. If you're curious in the previous five editions, uh, yeah, yeah, please go check it out. So um, this episode largely revolves around Mount Robson, the king of the Canadian Rockies. And for a long time, you know, we've referred to it by an improper indigenous name of Yahahuskin, but uh, we've recently learned that there is a more proper name to be applied to the mountain. And I really got to apologize because I'm working on the uh, pronunciation. But uh, yeah, maybe I can get that into uh, the chat box at some time. Um, yeah, but uh, nomenclature aside, this is the king. This is the greatest peak in the Canadian Rockies, kind of head and shoulders above all the rest. 700 feet higher than Mount Columbia, which is the second highest peak in North uh, or in the Canadian Rockies. And interestingly, uh, the highest peak in Alberta, although it's not wholly in Alberta. And had the uh, uh, border survey between uh, British Columbia and Alberta been done, I think it's five or eight years previously, um, some of the Robson Glacier drained into Alberta. There's a hill down there. It was long enough that some of it had water flowing into Alberta. So Alberta would have had a slice of the summit of Mount Robson. So yeah, we missed the boat by eight years, eight or 10 years and the glacier retreated and all the water now channels into British Columbia. Um, one of the amazing things about this mountain is for one, to be able to see it. So if you drive by and you see Robson stop you know, hike in there, get out of the car, take some pictures because you can drive by this mountain 60 days in a row and maybe only see it once. It really does create its own weather pattern. Why is that? From the Fraser River, which this picture is just a little bit above the Fraser River in the Denison pit, I think, um, you're looking at 3,000 meters of relief. I'll say that again, 3,000 meters of relief. So, you know, some of the savvy mountain climbers in the audience would know that that's the same as standing on the Rombuck outwashes the Rombuck Glacier and looking at Mount Everest. You're looking at 3,000 meters of relief. So this is a big mountain and such a big mountain that its rain shadow on this side, the westerly side has a hemlock and cedar forest. And the next hemlock and cedar forest is, you know, 100, 200 kilometers to the west because it's just not wet enough except for this place. So pretty darn cool peak and very, very rich with uh, Canadian mountaineering history, some of which, and this is a bit of a mind bender, when uh, Reverend George Kinney made one of his initial attempts at the peak, he rode horses from Morley, Alberta. That's that way from where I'm sitting right now. It's in between me and Calgary. So he rode past Lake Louise up to the Columbia ice fields into Jasper and it was on a month on horseback before he even saw the mountain. So pretty, pretty wild to think about, you know, that now I can leave my home in Canmore and be up to the mountain in maybe four hours, three, four hours, five hours of driving. I guess it depends who's driving. But uh, yeah, yeah, lots of history on Robson. And my own history with Robson, um, Oh, there it is. Um, 
begins uh, actually in, in, in the early 80s. I think 81 was the first time we went in there, me and Kevin Doyle and Stuart Broker and Ron Humble, and we bivouacked down here with the intent of getting up to the North Face, but it rained all night. So we ran away. <laughs> and then in uh, 1989, I came in with uh, this, this, this ambition that was to, to dominate my life for the next uh, 20 years, I guess, to put a winter route up on the emperor face of Mount Robson. So here's the emperor face, kind of the largest technical face on Robson. And from down here at the Robson River and Berg Lake, there's 7,000 feet of relief to the summit, which actually sits way the heck over here somewhere. Um, <clears throat> the north face of Robson, uh, famous uh, for being climbed in the 60s, but also being skied in the 90s and recently skied uh, by Dylan Cunningham, young guy who works with us here at YAM. So pretty wild. But in 1989, uh, yeah, my first time coming in um, to try to put a route up on this guy. And of course, thinking about the dead center of the face and uh, the cast of characters I was with. <coughs> from Toronto, Ontario, Canada, <laughs> weighing in at probably a hundred, no, maybe 220 at that time. His weight fluctuates a bit, but he's six foot four, so he can carry some. Big Jim Elzinga, whose son Stefan had given him Bert. I think that's Bert or it's either Ernie as a good luck charm. And uh, this is one of our snow caves and uh, uh, Ward Robinson, my other uh, uh, partner at the time who had a, a baby girl Jenna at that point. These, these folks are all grown up now and Jim's a grandfather. So this is 1989. And in a snow cave below, I think the emperor face, but it might below the, be below the north face. So that story is just about to unfold. And we're having a good time because we've done the two or three hours of heavy manual labor to dig a snow cave out of uh, a snow depth on the face, get in there, seal off the door, have some uh, ventilation holes, get the stove going, gets quite comfortable in these things. It's quiet, it's warm, and it's a good time to just, uh, you know, talk to your buddies and, and deal with a lot of stuff and, uh, yeah, come up with some, some, some uh, solutions uh, and then forget them all when you leave the snow cave. Anyways, yeah, we had uh, actually flown in in a helicopter Landed at Berg Lake, so a bit of a cheat. One of the only mountains we can cheat on in the Canadian Rockies. And that gave us a jump start. And thankfully, Jim was making good money in Toronto. Like, why else would it? No, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> so he was able to pay for the helicopter. And uh, yeah, yeah, we uh, spent the afternoon getting up uh, the mist uh, ice fall and then coming up and putting in that snow cave below the emperor face and uh, gunning for the emperor face the next day. And overnight, it was kind of a little bit uh, stormy when we got in there and our snow cave would have been up here somewhere. And uh, this is a shot actually from, well, I'll mention it later. But uh, yeah, our snow cave's up here and, uh, you know, a little bit cloudy day. And I remember flying in with the pilot and the pilot, um, really super curious about what we're doing. Really nice guy. And... Uh, yeah, he comes a little too close to the mountain talking to us about, uh, you know, where are you guys going? What are you doing? And there's a, a quite a lot of air rushing down the mountain, maybe psychonically rushing down. Anyways, helicopter drops like a rock, like 100 feet. <laughs> Ward's dad, uh, it's quite sad, actually. His dad was an Air Canada pilot, and he died in a plane crash, actually, crashing uh, in a jet crash. So Ward, as soon as this aircraft started plummeting through the air with no more air to push down, because all the air is moving at the same rate it can push it down, you know, white knuckles onto the, the, the canopy structure of the aircraft in the back. Like, <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God. And, you know, the pilots, oh no, I can't fight these. Sorry guys, sorry guys. Whap, 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 whap. Gotta, gotta go with these and loses some and turns out of it and gets away from the mountain and gets his lift back and, uh, yeah, yeah, gets us in and drops us off. So we spend all day in getting up to the snow cave. It's relatively warm that day. It's the third week of March, 1989. And yeah, yeah, I would have just turned uh, 30. Um, 
And, um, oh yeah, I should mention, I just turned 62 yesterday. <laughs> so there you go. Um, yeah, relatively warm that day, clouds leaving the mountain, that really kind of interesting, we uh, call it a strip tease actually. And it's the clouds slowly moving away, the dance of the seven veils and slowly being able to see more of the mountain. And uh, yeah, in this case, get to realize what you're dealing with. Um, but that next day we, we knocked the, the snow blocks out of the front of the snow cave and it was minus 40. So those are the same on the Celsius and Fahrenheit scale. No difference, the scales cross there. And by any measure, um, it's pretty darn cold. So I remember looking up at the face with these clouds of, of our breath hanging immovably in front of our faces. You exhale and it just turns into a cloud, just sits there because the air isn't moving. It's just an Arctic air mass is bulldozed down in and it's just plunk, right? High, high pressure. And Jim looks up at the face and he says, you know, if we try climbing technically in these temperatures, we're going to get frostbitten. And uh, he had been frostbitten on the Grand Central Couloir of Mount Kitchener in 77. And I don't think he wanted to repeat that. Neither did I want to experience it ever. I've actually never had deep frostbite. And uh, Ward looked up, he looked down and he spat. <laughs> so we came up with an alternative plan that we would get up to below the north face. The north face, we reasoned we could move together like solo up the face, keep moving, keep warm, and still maybe get to the top of the king, to the top of Mount Robson. So we spent all day going up the edge of the mist ice fall here. Um, this is dog buttress here. And we got another snow cave, a much bigger one in below the north face. We had time on our hands. So we dug a snow condominium, actually. It was, it was huge. And we were all pretty happy there until, you know, you know, you're hydrating and all that kind of stuff, melting snow and ice and, and getting food and water into you. And then it's time to pee. So what you do is you just unzip your sleeping bag, pull your thermarest aside and just drill a hole into the floor. And there's the evidence of the hole, all that yellow. <laughs> so I go to drill a hole in the floor and I go, Oh guys, we got a one inch crack. And there's a one inch crack going across the whole floor of the snow cave. We're basically camped over some kind of crevasse that is slowly in the process of opening. So we all freak out and we pile a bunch of snow in there. We tamp it all down and, you know, yeah, 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 mend the floor. And then we all go back to sleep. We're pretty tired. Sure enough, next time I pee, if I had that, pull it aside, one inch crack. <laughs> so yeah, we just climb away. We're gonna go to the North Face. We leave all our bivy gear there. We get up on the North Face and our tactic of moving together was a really good one um, because it was just so, so cold. Ward's, you know, nose and cheeks were constantly chalking uh, to, to, to chalk colored. And it's like, Ward, man, you're gonna get frostbitten nose and, and face here. So here, take my, my headband that my wife has given me with hearts on it. So that was able to keep his face protected. I had my neoprene face mask. Next step, step up in warmth, which if you ever go really cold environment climbing or high altitude and cold mix them is goggles. And that's a lot of face protection and that seems to work. Ear flap tube, goggles, neoprene face mask. Cut the, the hole, cut a hole so you can spit and drink and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, the age of the stew by, look at that. Stew by, stew by, stew by, stew by. And my stew by with the hammerhead cut in half, trying to save some weight. Also cut the spikes off some of them at the bottom, save some more weight. So yeah, always counting grams. And man, there's Ward, PA Troisième, halfway up the north face of Mount Robson. I just can't imagine skiing that. So it's it's kind of wild that people ski it and you know some uh braggadocia and uh hubristic uh extreme skiers will say extreme skiing where mountaineers fear to tread but mountaineers go overhanging so <laughs> you can't ski overhanging in vertical they do it at 220 feet at a time now but they yeah yeah so so no, i don't buy that mountaineers we we get pretty gnarly and steep ourselves thank you very much um, the summit of Robson, um, 
after, uh, you know, we soloed together, put the rope on to cross the Berg Shrund, Jimmy started to shrink into the Berg, sink into the Berg Shrund. That was a little spooky. So Ward and I hauled on the rope, got him out of there. And uh, at the top, we put the rope on for the last pitch of the phase to get over onto the ridge. And uh, yeah, it was wild. You step onto the sunlit side and get into the sun and suddenly you're taking off clothes and stuff is melting off. The air temperature is still minus 40, but such intense sunlight and just felt so good at that point. And poor Jimmy down on the face, because I think Ward and I, I went second maybe, where I led our guy, Jimmy ended up hanging down there for a while. So he was getting pretty damn cold by the time we brought him up. But uh, so cool to be on top of the king in an absolutely still day with the most visibility possible. You know, pretty, pretty magic. And uh, yeah, pretty cool to get over to the cane face and descend the cane face. And we wrapped off snowballers the whole way. If you climb in Scotland, you do a lot of snowballer wrapping, but in the Rockies, it's so infrequent that you find dense enough, well-bonded enough snow, they can actually carve snowballers. And we wrapped the whole cane face pretty much on snowballers and figured out the stew by ring ads, the circular ads that they had on the top of the stew by because they could never tell when the threads would come tight. If they put a flat ads, it might end up looking like this, like a wood axe or something. So a circular ads. And the only thing it was, was good for, perfect for opening a beer bottle. Absolutely. Couldn't have been designed better to open a beer bottle. And then chopping snowballs. Brilliant for chopping snowballs. So, yeah, we, 17-hour uh, day, and we made it back to our snow cave just in the fading part of the day. I don't know if we had to have headlamps. But we got in to our snow cave and we had a split level snow cave. This crack had opened to like a foot in width and the differential in the floor was two feet. <laughs> so we had a split level. So we had to level it all, tamp it all back in there. And we we're just too exhausted to dig a new snow cave. So we all lay down. I go take the first piss a couple hours later and yeah, one inch crack on across the bottom of the snow cave. Yeah, good that we didn't all fall in there. So... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that was 89. So, yeah, I guess eight years later, finally got back to go back to Robson and try the Emperor face, 97. And uh, not with Jim and Ward, they were on to doing different things. So uh, Joe Josephson from Montana and Steve House from Oregon, um, you know, affectionately known as the farm boy and Jojo and uh, some of my really important uh, Alpine brothers. And I uh, was so fortunate to be, you know, uh, in uh, that time, I would have been pushing 40. So getting into my late 30s, a little long in the tooth for being the kind of Alpine athlete that you really need to be on these faces. So really nice that I could hook up with some of the youth and uh, share some of my uh, experience and profit from some of their ability and their endurance and strength. Um, yeah, I guess I shouldn't pay myself, play myself down too much. I was still pretty confident, just nowhere near as confident as I was in my early 30s. So, yeah, Jojo and Steve. And uh, Steve, you know, Jojo invited him the day before. Grant Statham was supposed to come in with us, but Grant had to go do something else in life. So Steve call her Jojo calls up Steve and says, can you meet us to go to Robson? When? Like tomorrow. Hell yeah. So he gets in his car, drives all the way up from, I think he was living in Washington at that point and meets us in the uh, parking lot below that West face of Robson, those 3000 meters of relief. And yeah, we took a helicopter in again and I was living on the largesse of, I think a movie called The Edge. I made decent money and uh, I paid for the helicopter. So yeah, we helicopter in and uh, our plan is to get up and get onto the uh, uh, emperor face, kind of the same idea as Warden and Jimmy and I had and hopefully put a root up here. And uh, we made a very uh, bold attempt at that root up there. So this would be part of what is now referred to as the jaws where three gullies come together on the face, I'm pretty darn sure. And this is around where we turned around. And why would you turn around? 
weather looks really threatening, doesn't it? <laughs> Another big Arctic air mass. But now we've learned, we've gone in April. So it's only like minus 20 or something. It's not minus 40. So yeah, we reason that anytime you've got a clear, still, perfect uh, weather for climbing or visibility, if you go in March, it's going to be really, really cold. Although that may not be the case anymore. But back then it was. So we started to target April. And then the first days in there, you know, after the flight in, we had perfect weather. So we go storming up on the face. And I think this is the night after our bivouac in a torpedo tube where I would pass stuff from the stove down by Steve, finally get to Jojo at the end of this 15 foot long torpedo tube snow cave. Cause you know, that's all the snow you have. So you gotta go long. And Jojo's cup would come back empty by the three of us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The next day, this is snow ice. Yeah, yeah, probably enough to climb, but nowhere near enough to protect. I think both Steve and I tried to get up here. I think that might be me up there. And yeah, I remember getting up here somewhere around here and it's just getting too serious and the consequence of a fall too serious. And I'm like, I don't know, Steve, I think maybe you should come and take a look. I don't know what you could do up there, Bubba, that I can. And I said, yeah, yeah, maybe you can. <laughs> I can't remember if he went up and tried or not, but we retreated. It was too hard. And we went all the way back to the Hargrave shelter and, uh, you know, log cabin back there on Berg Lake. No one there. So, yeah, the boys sleeping out on the deck the next morning, trying to warm up in the sun. And we didn't take this carpenter's saw up on the mountain with us. We took it from the hut. And when we could find any kind of dead wood, we used the saw and uh, used the stove inside the hut. <laughs> Don't tell the parts. They'll probably be PO'd at me. <laughs> but, okay, so the jaws didn't work. We spied this line to the right and thought, okay, it looks like there's, there's definitely alpine ice in there. And then that looks like a strip of ice. So if we can connect those two features, I think we might have a chance of doing this route. So rested for a couple days in there, did a little bit of water ice climbing, actually did some really cool climbs in there on water ice and mixed on a little cliff at the end of Bird Lake, the near end. And then weather was good. So we took our second shot at the Emperor and uh, went up this moraine. And then uh, something we did several more times that Jim and the ward and I had done was to get around the initial rock band by getting up against the mist icefall. Just a dangerous place to be, pretty spooky. Those are seracs, cubic meter of that stuff weighs a metric ton, two, a thousand kilograms. And these are chunks of it of a fallen down. And if you're there when it falls down, it's really, really gonna hurt. So we kind of rushed through there and try to minimize our exposure. But yeah, eventually figured we didn't want to do that anymore. So we, we made uh, alternate, uh, alternate ways to get around that. So 97, that initial core, ancient, ancient, ancient ice. And top of the couloir, a, stiff, a steep rock band, but we knew if we traversed left, we could connect to another ice face and hopefully that magic strip of ice. And this we called the traverse of the stubbies because the ice thinned down and the way we protected it was four 10 centimeter stubby ice schools. That was the protection going across the traverse of the stubbies. And the other ice face existed and we topped that out and we had this steeper rock band and Steve led it, probably some five, seven nicks climbing in there. And there's the magic strip of ice. But by this point, we'd climbed 5,000 feet that day. So 1,500 meters and it was getting to be a 20 hour plus day and we needed to bivouac. So we traversed out over here and got a ledge out on the Emperor Ridge. Uh, First climb by uh, Ron Perla, who I think still lives in town here. Ron Perla and uh, another snow ranger from uh, down in Utah. I know that other guy's name too, but just can't bring it up right now because I'm old. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. It's actually a picture from looking across from one of the ice climbs that we did. And yeah, the dangerous passage of going up through here to gain access to the emperor face, something we refined in future attempts and ended up going here. Other people have climbed out here somewhere just to get away from having the threat of getting crushed by a Serac 
anytime you can get away from being crushed by a Serac is a good, good thing to do. But yeah, here's our feature top of that old ancient ice gully and the traverse of the stubbies, the triangular ice face. And then the magic strip ice isn't popping right there, but um, we've come out, there's the steep rock band and we've come out over here to a bivouac and a long, long day, lots of effort, lots of calories, dehydration going on. So we really need to hydrate. And as we're getting ready into our bivy sacks and our sleeping bags, pads, all that kind of stuff, okay, where's the stove? Steve hands me a fuel bottle and then the stove. And I look and I go, where's, where's the pump? So we've got the uh, part of the plunger, but we don't have the pumping mechanism. Where's, where's the plunger? Where's the pump? Steve's like, oh my God. So it pulls everything apart like two or three times. And over the next hour, we realize that somewhere I'm unpacking, the pump to the stove has gone down the face. We just can't find it. So in my repair kit, I have a spare leather washer, which is integral to compressing the white fuel and making the stove work. So Steve takes my extra leather washer and some coat hanger that I have as a backup Belikoff puller and it can repair stuff. And he makes a plunger and spends all like hours trying to get the stove to compress fuel and all of his effort you know, results in nearly, you know, very, very cold hands, but, you know, a, a, a quarter or like a cup of slosh water. So, yeah, we don't have a stove. And, uh, you know, Steve at that point is an alpinist in his young 20s, and he's just on fire to climb, he wants to be the best alpinist he can be, and eventually becomes one of the best alpinists in the world. And, uh, you know, he looks suicidal when I look at him. And he's, you know, I can just tell he's beating himself up. And, you know, it's almost like he's going to take his ice axes and slit his wrists. So I look at him and I say, you know, Steve, at the end of your life, when you sum up all the screw-ups you're going to make, this is going to seem like pretty small change. <laughs> he's like, gee, thanks, Bubba. And anyways, <coughs> excuse me, in the morning, um, <clears throat> we end up retreating. We're just too dehydrated. The thought of we're only halfway up the McKinney. We still have another, you know, lots of ground to cover. Um, we're just too dehydrated. We're not going to make it. So we descend all the way around here, walk around here and, and ski out. And that's our, my second attempt at putting um, a route up on the emperor face of Mount Robson. And Steve would go to coin it our annual attempt and failure to climb the upper face of Mount Robinson. So the next year, 1998, we're back in the parking lot again. And one of the last episodes in this series, um, one of the climbs covered is the silver lining. We didn't have the weather forecast, so we climbed the silver lining. That was the second or my third annual, second annual attempt and failure to climb Mount Robinson. Um, 1999, didn't have the snow conditions. We ended up going to Howe's Peak. So that was the third annual attempt and failure to climb Mount Robson. Year 2000, we actually got in there on someone else's dime with black and white productions. And as part of a climbing video that they put together called Beyond, Beyond Gravity, you know, one of the Sean, Sean White or Sean Black was out here on Dog Buttress filming as Jojo and Steve and I repeated that day of 97, we climbed 5,000 feet right to the same bivy. We were psyched and then the weather crapped out. So we had to retreat again. So yeah, yeah, 2001, the fifth annual attempt and failure to climb Mount Robson. Um, we didn't have the conditions again and it was a pretty dry, low snowfall year in the Rockies. And uh, um, this gentleman, Johnny Blitz, and uh, Steve House and Rolando Gerabati, uh, uh, our, our charming Argentine friend who still speaks with a very charming Argentine accent, even though both of these men are now living in Austria. So I tease them about wearing later hose and frolicking in a meadow. But yeah, <laughs> we can, we, <laughs> it will be good. <laughs> no, <laughs> we cannot go to the emperor. No. <laughs> So, yeah, Rolo, <laughs> often putting no as a positive negative at the end of his sentences and, and so charming. 
and such a powerful power, both these guys, but Lolo, just an exceptional rock climber, so good on rock. Um, so yeah, 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 Ninth year uh, 2001, we want to go to the Emperor, but we don't have the conditions, so we go up to the Columbia Ice Fields, and all four of us, Blitz was with us, we wore out a pair of skins going into a climb called Echo Madness, um, at the head of, uh, it's on Mount Kitchener, basically, between Kitchener and Stuckfield, and pretty big ice climb, some amazingly uh, concerning avalanche slopes to do this ice climb. And uh, we did that and and Steve was, uh, you know, oh man, I came up to Canada to alpine climb. I just don't want to go ice climbing. So we all get back to Saskatchewan River crossing where the four of us are living in one little motel room. And uh, yeah, it's, it's knee deep in gear and uh, smells like a locker room and all that kind of stuff. But uh, Steve in the morning says, you know, I came here to alpine climb. If I can't alpine climb, I think I'll, I'll go home. And I said to him, man, you should go check out a line that's on the east face of Mount Faye. Um, you know, yeah, check that out before you go south. You can see it from the Lake Louise ski area at the, the bottom lodge there with binoculars. You'll be able to ski it, see it. So Rolo and, and uh, 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 Blitz and I stay there, do some more ice climbing. And uh, we come back to my condo in Canmore and Steve's car is there. And Blitz says, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> so Steve, you know, followed my advice and, and went and uh, scoped out this line on the uh, east face of Mount Fay. And he's so excited looking at it, his hands are trembling. Like there's the downhill ski crowd around him, drinking beer and, you know, music and stuff. And he's like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> so yeah, he goes that day back to my place and he goes to the hardware store that, yeah, and buys kitty sleds so we can haul our packs in because it's, you know, a 12 mile ski into this, this area and he gets fuel and gets food, he gets all the logistics covered. And uh, unfortunately, Blitz couldn't go with us. He, he ran out of time. He had to go back and be a pilot. And I, you know, he said, I got to go back to landing jets. I said, well, yeah, what does that mean? Well, they, anyone can fly and they kind of fly themselves, take them off and all that kind of, it's landing is what I get paid for. So Blitz had to go back to landing jets. So he couldn't go into Fay with us. But this line on the east face of Fay was known. And uh, yeah, I should backtrack here. And uh, this is, uh, um, oh, Mount Babel and Brian Greenwood's famous route up here and the Tower of Babel, Moraine Lake is down around the corner. You can see a little bit of Mount Fay here. This is Mount Quadra, this is Mount Biden. This is a famous ice climb called Gimme Shelter. First climbed by a couple of the other people in this series, Kevin Doyle and Tim Friesen in 83, I think. And after Jeff and Alex Lowe had retreated and I can't remember why those two retreated, but interesting that the Canuck boys pulled that off. And I've never climbed that route. Don't know at this point in my life I ever will. I just can't, I'd be too nervous under those Ciracs all day or for two days. So anyways, word gets out around town, our little town of Canmore, that uh, Rolo and Steve and I are gonna go in and try this, that this line that Steve Holatsy you know, bemoans and says, oh man, that's the crown jewel of the Canadian Rockies this season. And there's what we're gunning for. This line of ice here. This is the one that got Steve's binoculars shaking in his hands, uh, kind of surrounded by downhill skiers. So, you know, we head in there um, with our kitty sleds, dragging our sleds up there. We get to Constellation Lakes and we leave Rolo down there with uh, uh, the, the, the little tarp we have, and he's gonna establish camp. And Steve and I are gonna go up, punch in a track to below the climb and hopefully establish a rope, like climb the first pitch. And interesting for me to be skiing up this drainage and going underneath the east face of Mount Fay that was in the first episode of this series. And we can't see a lot of the route, but uh, where I climbed with David Cheeseman and Carl Tobin in 1984, 
and to go by there and feel the presence of my friend David, who was lost on Mount Logan in 1987, to look where Carl and David and I had climbed and to be in that aura again was, uh, was interesting, was connective and uh, touching and memorializing. So felt good to feel David going through there. And uh, yeah, so as we're, Steve and I are heading up to the crown jewel of the Canadian Rockies that as we're getting closer, we're realizing this is, this is no gimme. This is a pretty damn serious piece of ice. Um, Rolo's back at camp, melting lots of water, making little benches in the snow and, you know, making it really comfy for us when we get back. And these, uh, I, I need to backtrack even more because, you know, we start skiing in in the early morning at kind of just at dawn with the plan of getting to Constellation Lake. And there's another truck in the parking lot. And it looks like a climber's truck, an old beat up four by four. And it's like, oh my God, are there other climbers going for our line? And we go over and look and there's a waterfall ice climbing guide on the dash. Oh my God, Steve puts his hand on the hood to feel for heat, it's cold. They're way ahead of us. So as we're skiing up, we're fretting about someone stealing our, our line. And uh, we get further up the valley and can see that there's a couple of climbers on Gimme Shelter. So like whew, dodge that bullet. And Rolo down at the lake making dinner and soup and all that kind of stuff. You know, Rob Owens and a partner come skiing down from their ascent of Gimme Shelter. And Rob's like, oh my God, who are you? What are you doing here? Oh, I am Rolo. I'm, I'm here to climb that. And Rob's like, huh, my friends, Raphael and Eamon are coming in to try that tomorrow. Who are you with? Oh, I am with Barry and Steve. <laughs> so <clears throat> Rob skis out and uh, shares this information with uh, Raphael and Eamon who immediately ski in and they bivouac at the cook shelter down at Moraine Lake. So they're three or four kilometers farther away from the face than us, but they want to get there first. Like the race is on, you know, <laughs> and uh, Rob, you know, is so psyched. He considers not sleeping and skiing back in to join Eamon and Ralph. So yeah, yeah, that's all going on unbeknownst to uh, Steve and I who are up here to climb this first pitch. There's the Constellation Lake. So somewhere on the near end, Rolo's got our, our, uh, our uh, camp being developed. And Steve climbing about it, ice is about, about as good as anyone on the planet can at that point, probably in the top 12, you know, launches on this, this pitch. And I kind of did myself a, a disfavor because I, you know, usually climbers tilt the camera the wrong way to make it look steeper. And in that picture I just showed to Steve, I actually had the camera like getting a picture while belaying. So I had it tilted the wrong way to make it less steep. But uh, that's kind of more indicative of the true angle of this thing. And the thing that makes it really difficult is it's very, very steep and there's not a lot of ice there. So it's quite serious ice climbing. And indeed a lot of the protection is on rock gear. So very engaging ice climbing. So to compensate, you know, I, I tilted my camera or my iPhone looking at my computer screen and that's kind of more what it's like because all of this stuff is is hanging in plumb. It's hanging with gravity, the heavy cans and stuff. So yeah, end story is it's really, really steep ice climbing. Steep enough to the point that Steve lost his feet a couple of times going up there like they scratched out. And uh, you know, quite a long episode of belaying. So that picture is down here. Steve gets up, gets rock gear, gets ice gear, using good two rope techniques and did something really brilliant here. He went around the back of this icicle. So the icicle becomes protection for him. So very, very uh, tactically smart move and gets up, gets over here and even gets up into here to where he can get a rock and ice anchor, anchor the ropes. So we have this pitch um, in situ for the next day. And we can use these little new devices that are so light, they're called T-blocks, little rope clamps um, that weigh far less than a Jumar, a traditional spring-loaded rope ascending device. So we have these little tiny T-blocks. And uh, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we get back down to Rolo and Rolo tells us a story. And the next day we all take off early. And uh, yeah, you know, we're, we're going up the approach slope. And I see this, this kind of otherworldly blue light. And I think, wow, are our headlamps reflecting off ice chunks or something? What is that? And it comes and goes. And I think, weird. And then I was like, oh my God, that's one of those new fancy LED headlamps. And whoever has it is turning them on and off intermittently, sneakily, like clandestinely. They're trying to scoop us. <laughs> so, you know, Rolo figures this out. He goes, okay, now we are racing. <laughs> Rolo puts it onto eight cylinders, opens up the carbs and charges up to this ice climb. And, uh, you know, Raphael and uh, Eamon aren't slouches. They're very, very fit gentlemen themselves. But when we catch up to Raphael and Eamon, and this is the picture that Raph took of me in that encounter in the wee hours, Eamon looks like he stepped out of a sauna. You know, he's like, like a hot tub. He is just dripping with sweat. His clothing is damp, like he's slathered in sweat. And he's like, oh my God, who is that guy? And I just started laughing. I said, oh man, that's Rolando. You know, and Eamon's like, we tried to catch him, but I said, you know, you can't catch Rolando. Rolando has the Alex gene, you know, the Alex low gene. He's uncatchable. And kind of true, you know, those, those two, I'm sure they've had their uh, pulmonology examined and they would be Olympic level, level athletes. Like their ability to get oxygen out of the atmosphere and into their bloodstream is at another level. And uh, yeah, yeah, Rolo turned that on. And uh, we tried to figure out how we could accommodate our party of three and their party of two on this first ascent. But it was just so linear that uh, there was just no way that someone down low wouldn't be, you know, clobbered by ice chunks and it would just be too dangerous, basically. So Raph and Eamon basically being gentlemen bowed out and Raph even allowed me to call my wife on his cell phone, his flip cell phone to say, yeah, we're just towards the base of the route and everything's going okay. Pretty psyched to be there. And after that uh, Jumaring, T-blocking fiasco, and our T-blocking technique was not as good as it should be, but man, we chewed the crap out of two brand new 70 meter half ropes. And that kind of hurts, you know, that's, that's a valuable possession for an alpinist ropes, of course, but these little T-blocks, we'd move them up and go to weight and would slip down and the teeth would scar up the sheath, not dangerously, but, uh, definitely aged the ropes a bunch just on this one ascent. So we concluded that Jumars were worth it in the future. You know, we would bring Jumars on this if we needed them. So I went to lead the second pitch after we got up Steve's magnificent pitch. And uh, yeah, it was, you know, amazing piece of climbing. So for me to get over to where there's more concentrated ice, I had to climb down from Steve's anchor, then across and, uh, um, get to where the ice is deeper. And uh, I think I had one shot similar to this up at an ice festival in Michigan. And it was even bigger. So the sticker on my back of my helmet that says bad cop, no donut is seriously like a four by eight sheet of plywood on this screen with an audience of a hundred plus listening to my slideshow. And as I'm talking about the slide with bad cop, no donut <laughs> and bullet holes <laughs> that Blitz gave us to, to add levity to our climbing. Um, a, a Texas County Mountie starts, he's not Texas County, but he's got the Mountie hat on. He starts walking through the audience. It's like, oh my God, I'm in trouble for my sticker. So I change the slide and the guy comes up, excuse me, there's a car outside, license plate, blah, 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 blah. So yeah, some good, uh, good, good cop stuff. <laughs> so yeah, over across to where the ice is deeper, if you can call it that. Such steep, serious ice climbing. There's Gimme Shelter in behind with that considerable Serac thread overhead. And uh, my lead was 35 meters. And man, I got worked physically, intellectually, emotionally, probably spiritually too. But I remember being up there and thinking this is just so serious. You know, I don't know if I can pull these moves. I'm running out of steam. And once again, suggest, Steve, I think you should come up and 
do this. I don't know if I could do it. And he's like, I don't know, Baba, you look really good. You're controlling it. And I'm like, okay, that, that makes me feel better. <laughs> so I keep going and it's like, I don't know. And you're like, why do you, how's it going? I'm losing my mind up here, man. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it all comes down to like a, a three meter stretch or something where I can see there's an ice blob deep enough to take a, an ice screw and I got to get there and I'm walking off to get there and my arm is fading and <laughs> starting to tremble and all that kind of stuff. But I made it to the beach ball, got the ice screw sunk and then I stood on top of the beach ball and there was a crack there crack in the rock so I think I put two or three rock pieces in there bought it all down yeah you know, risk wise and got up to where I could anchor and uh yeah yeah the boys coming up that pitch so the traverse over to the thickening of the ice and uh you know the couple of pieces of rock gear are right there steep serious ice climbing I don't know that ice climbing does get steeper than this does it get more serious than this it's a good question um yeah, and at this anchor, you know, Steve and I, observing proper climbing etiquette, say to Rolo, like, okay, Rolo, it, it's your lead. And he looks at us, he goes, no, let's don't even play this game, no? Steve should lead. <laughs> so, yeah, Steve took over and, and just did his magic, two or three rope lengths more. And, uh, you know, just kept putting the rope over our heads. And we're now free climbing, we're not doing any tee blocking after that first pitch and uh i remember at the top of his third lead we get to the anchor and he looks someone else is gonna have to lead the next pitch i'm getting tired and rollo and i look at like like at each other like condemned man and uh and rollo says to at the next anchor so i went for another lead but the next anchor he's like he's 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 really uh, taken aback and he's aghast and kind of flabbergasted he says i'm getting bicep cramps the last time I had bicep cramps, I led the nose of El Cap every pitch in one day. I have not had bicep cramps since then. <laughs> like, yeah, it's steep. It's hard, man. <laughs> and uh, I lead a pitch and the boys come up. Steve's kind of recovered and there's a connecting rock pitch that I think Rolo takes over. But somewhere around here, Steve's up on lead and a snow mushroom breaks loose from the face and crashes down just 10, 20 meters to our left. Same kind of event that, you know, broke my leg on House Peak in 99 and bruised my shoulder badly in 84 on uh, the east face of Mount Fay. So pretty spooky. And uh, Rolo and I are like, Steve, I don't know. Maybe you should come down. He's like, I can't make those decisions right now, guys. I got to keep climbing. So Rolo and I are left to make the decision about continuing or retreating and Steve has to keep moving. And we're like, okay, if one more comes down, we're out of here. <laughs> so thankfully, no other snow mushrooms broke off the face that day. And uh, Rolo uh, doing his magic on rock and connecting us. We had to get from a right ice flow to a left ice flow. And then Steve doing another couple pitches of great ice climbing. Not as steep and hard anymore, nor as serious. I think we're getting dependable ice gear now. And... Uh, yeah, probably grade five-ish ice climbing. Getting to be a long day, um, pushing 20 hours maybe. So we're starting to get the stove out in between pitches and, and brew. And I should just go back to this picture. Rolando, you know, just this, this exotic Latin name for most Canadians. And, you know, the guy, I think he might be listening right now, so he'll probably put a comment in the thing section. He's 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 just one of the most handsome guys I think I've ever seen, right? He's just, he's handsome. So we would call him uh, Rolando Grab Your Body, <laughs> just to tease him. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Rolando working the little titanium stove, melting snow and ice, and about the 23 hour mark 27 hours 27 hours we were on the go and uh, a couple things happened we ran out of ice we're onto the upper part of the mountain the angle is going to kick back we want to go to the summit we're alpinists and the snow is just so terrible it's like waist deep facets so dry sugar snow that's tacked it together very very lightly kind of stuff you see a lot in peru and in the himalaya 
And Steve takes a shovel blade and for 60 meters digs a trench up this 60 degree slab of rock. And he digs a trench to the top and puts in an anchor. It's just like, you know, Rolando and I the next day going up this trench, like trench warfare. Um, Rolando's like, can you believe this goddamn guy? <laughs> but he comes back down and we dig a little snow cave. And after 27 hours, we just get in there and we all sit on our packs and we start to pass out like bums in front of the fire. Just got our stove going. We're making liquids, drinking tea, you know, getting a little bit of food inside us. I think we had itchy bands or something. And then it's daylight. So after three hours of resting in our little snow cave, we go out into the new day. And actually this is Panorama Pass and the Trans-Canada Highways back there. You can actually see this part of the upper part of Mount Faye from the highway and another great position for me to drive by and look up and uh, get uh, cloaked in the memory of that day, a couple days on this mountain with those two men. And uh, yeah, pretty uh, photographic, beautiful morning, but the snow was just, it finally got to be too much effort for even men of vision like ourselves and it was just too sick just unsupported snow that was so difficult and frustrating and infuriating to try to get up that somewhere up here we just said this isn't worth it i don't know if we're even going to make the summit today if we have to keep trenching through this crap so we would sometimes if you had skis there you'd ski down here or you would climb down here to get to the quadra glacier we had to rappel down on our knees to stay on what little crust there was and avoid breaking into the waist and chest and facets. It was just a horrible, horrible snow year. Just, yeah, vile, unbonded snow. But we get onto this Quadra Glacier and walk across. So summit of Mount Fay, way back up in there somewhere. We've made it somewhere up in here before it just got too sick and have come down. We're walking across the Quadra Glacier you could land a 747 on skis up there, I'm, I believe. And uh, yeah, you know, give me shelters below us. That route with all its difficulty, and all its serac thread is below us. We're walking above it. Quite a quite a interesting thing to think about. I'm pretty sure my buddy Claire Israelson skied this gully on Mount Quadra. So yeah, yeah, we get to the far end of Quadra, um, the glacier, and descend this gully beside Biden. And um, yeah, a little threatened by Serac, so we didn't dally there. We, you know, cranked through there pretty darn fast and picked up our stuff and got out and already started talking about in the car on the way back, you know, maybe we can go back someday. And uh, yeah, we could have a better snow year and push it to the summit of Fay and, and, you know, create the alpine route that we wanted to create and maybe Blitz can come. And we can call it, instead of Sands Blitz, the ice route we created, Avec Blitz. <laughs> Success. So, yeah, that was the fifth annual attempt and failure to climb Mount Robson. So that summer, 2001, I was really busy guiding Rolando and Steve came up and went in the summertime. And, uh, yeah, didn't get the weather. It rained on them the whole time. So they had to run away. I got some emails from uh, 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 Jean, Christophe, Jean Christophe Lafayette about the Emperor phase. And he was the, you know, you know, one of the very best mountain climbers, full stop, period, at that point. And it was like, you know, if, if you were a basketball player and Michael Jordan started sending you texts about coming and joining your game at 21 or whatever, it's like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, Jean Christophe Lafayette is coming. Well, at that point, you know, Steve was probably getting to be of equal ability. Um, yeah, and then some Slovenian guys came up in the fall and repeated our effort of uh, 97 and 21 or 2000 year 2000 and retreated and called it a new route. And I said, well, wait, 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 you can't call it a new route. You didn't go to the top or anything like that. And uh, yeah, so yeah, got pretty psyched about getting back there that next winter and finally getting this thing done. And then I got a call from uh, Eric Dumarak, buddy from Canmore, fellow mountain guide saying, you know, 
myself and uh, my buddy from France, Philippe Pelé, are going to go in and try, you know, the, that the emperor face. Do you want to come with us? And I'm like, oh man, I'm too busy. I don't think I can. And it's the second week of October, I think. And I look at it and I go, oh man, I'm clearing my schedule. So I clear my schedule and I join the boys and we fly in again. And uh, yeah, yeah, we're gunning up for the route up here that Steve and Jojo and I have been trying to put together all these times and, you know, various partners. So this is my sixth or seventh attempt going out to climb the Emperor Face and Mount Robson. And uh, this time in the fall, which was a change, the first winter temperatures have come. The big lakes are still ice free, although they're starting to ice up around the edges. And uh, yeah, the very first pitch, technical pitch that we do is probably the hardest pitch on the whole route. And we do it to avoid going under those seracs. And Philippe, who's a career uh, rescue specialist in the Alps and a mountain guide, he's from Briançon. And uh, yeah, he doesn't speak a lot of English. I don't speak a lot of French. So Eric becomes our bilingual. Eric is our, you know, he, he conveys information back and forth and translation. And unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, Eric has quite a sense of humor. But uh, yeah, Philippe gets up, goes across this egg crust shell of snice, gets to this newborn water ice. This stuff had just formed in the last 48 hours and uh, gets us up and uh, quite a, a great pitch. And I get here and get stuck thinking I'm going to come off because of the weight of my pack. And finally, after a lot of screaming and shouting and translating, managed to hang my pack by one of the ropes and watch it go swing over there and slam into the ice like a sack of horse crap. I really hated my pack at that point. And uh, then I could climb across and we could haul up my pack and haul up Eric's. Um, yeah, and Philippe's. <clears throat> and then Eric got a really beautiful uh, water ice four pitch and that put us into the base of that huge ancient gully that Jojo and Steve and I had been into a couple of times. Time to bivouac, so the shovel blade goes on to the handle of the shovel and we carved out a nice big flat platform. And I had mentioned on another bivouac on Mount Temple in 1992, that it is just so rare 10 years later to have a bivy, an open bivy on an alpine face with no snow drifting down off the face at all. Calm, no wind. Um, yeah, and just put out your sleeping bag and lie down and, you know, get the stove going, do all that. And then night comes on and the northern lights just burned across the firmament like burning jade. The three of us lay there, uh, just mouths jaw drop and just watching the northern lights. And yeah, the next morning, I was quite surprised. I suggested soloing up into this uh, ice cool war and Philippe said you know through Eric Philippe said a bunch of stuff in French and then Eric says he thinks we should put on the rope and put in screws and I go okay <laughs> I'm really surprised that a modern French alpinist is uh, <laughs> deciding on less risk rather than more risk so we did we put the rope on put in screws moved together a lot uh, made anchors once in a while the traverse of the stubbies looks like I was in the lead because here comes Philippe and then Eric coming up at the end. Eric taking over the lead here, looking at a really nice open book corner, probably five, seven rock climbing difficulty. And I'm having this conversation with Eric and it's hard to dissuade Eric from anything once he gets his mindset to it. It's like, you should leave your pack here, climb this 50 feet and you know use one of the ropes to haul your pack up so you're free of your pack and you can, you know, don't have to do with your pack. No, no, I got this, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this, so okay cannonball of a man wearing his heart on his sleeve heads up there and somewhere around here you know he's panting pretty hard working pretty hard and saying yeah you were right i should have left my pack down there <laughs> but he pulled it off and uh yeah we get over to connect to that triangular ice face i think i climbed at this point you know 20 years in the alpine the hard alpine just to get a photo like this that uh yeah it just says a lot the shadow of robson and uh you know glaciation and all of the stuff that makes alpinism a pretty magic place to be and that photo was down on this ridge down here and we got into this ice face 
and uh, got up the ice face, got through the, the steep rock band that Steve had led, and Philippe took us into Jack's Beanstalk, just this magic strip of ice that went up for, I don't know, half a dozen little planks. And climbing just doesn't get any better than me, you know? Challenging enough, good rock, good ice, good protection, good anchors, no real objective threats, just so good. You know, kind of stuff you dream of in your mind. The mountains of your mind come up with this kind of terrain. And, uh, uh, you know, I said before that, uh, uh, um, <laughs> uh, not Jervasudi, but uh, maybe it was Jervasudi. No, was it Jervasudi? Kamisi, Emilio Kamisi. Let a drop of water fall from the summit, and that's where I shall climb the definition of the directissima, the direct route up the mountain face. And this is Kamisi's drop of water frozen in time. And uh, Canadian, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just wrote, a, 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 I guess, a really good uh, biography of Kamisi. Dave Smart, I need to read it. And uh, yeah, it pops a little bit more in this picture now, don't it? <laughs> so there's our gully, Traverse of the Stubbies, that picture on the arete, the triangular ice face. And there's Kamisi's drop of water, frozen in time that we got to the top of this day. Went out onto the Emperor Ridge and had a bivouac. Joined a route that had been climbed in the 60s but not in winter time and really cold out here, minus 30 with the wind chill. And I had to alert Eric to his face blanching with that first stage of frostbite again, or you're gonna get frostbitten, get him to protect his face. But what was really cool is the French guys did the catering and the French eat better than I do as a Western Canadian. It's just, it, it's a proven fact, you can't argue that. We had spicy Thai noodle soup. We had a slice of ham with garnish and everything. Like we ate really, really good. You know, Jojo and Steve and I, we have, you know, uh, macaroni and cheese that we get out of the box and put in a plastic bag. And then, you know, we might add butter to that or something, but these guys had like garlic butter. So you just eat really well when you're with the French. So yeah, yeah, I got a really great pitch the next morning, uh, an ice chimney, great, great pitch. And then we're on to this ridge that Perla, and his partner climbed in the 60s, but in winter conditions. So, wow, two screw ice anchor. Yeah, convenient patch of ice. How convenient is that? And somewhere in the day before, somewhere around here, Philippe, who hadn't climbed with leashes in probably five years, he'd gone leashless with made wooden handles for his ice axes back in the day, so he didn't have to wear wrist leashes, leashes which is now the way people climb. So he got, he put on the leashes for this ascent in the Alpine with Eric and I, and I think they confused him because he dropped his first ice axe somewhere in here and Eric and I heard it pinging, and, you know, going off down the mountain, never, ever to be found again. And there's a whole bunch of screaming and shouting in French and, you know, I asked Eric, what'd he say? Oh, he's not happy, man. No, no, Eric, I didn't get that. You're kidding. <laughs> so, yeah. So we're going up the ridge, Philippe. Uh, leads out on the north face. This is actually 5'9 crack, I think, and uh, does a great job. He's a phenomenal climber. Gets up and he's twisting around at the anchor and he drops his second two off the mountain. And, you know, he starts <laughs> going off for, you know, a couple minutes until he's breathless, stringing together profanity in French. And I can catch every 10th profane word, but I wonder what he says, you know. So I like, uh, Eric, what do you say? Oh, he's pissed, man. No, really, Eric, I didn't get that. And then uh, I, and Eric says, wait, wait, this is good. This is good. He says, okay, when we get down, he wants us to take us, take him to the nearest mental hospital. And he doesn't care where it is, the nearest one, and he wants us to check him in. So yeah, what it meant for the team is that the leader had two ice axes and the seconds would have one ice axe. So I figured we could have dropped one more ice axe and probably been okay. But uh, yeah, we're on the ridge now and we're getting to the gargoyles. Only on the king can you see these rhyme formations in the Canadian Rockies. Some of these are 80 feet high and they're wind deposited rhyme, moisture condensing directly onto the mountain and growing. So these things don't have 
rock in their core. Often they may even be hollowish in their core. And there they are in rank and file and legion going to the top of the king. And they're beautiful to look at. They look like kind of white flame strikes or something, just amazing features to look at. But they're pretty darn challenging to climb through. And even though the boys and I are pretty darn happy about being up that high, I make a decision and get us out of these gargoyles. And we do a one kilometer traverse on 45 to 50 degree ice slopes to get over to an exit gully that was climbed by Don, Don, Don Clouch and his partners as the finish to the uh, Wishbone Arete in the late 50s or early 60s. And uh, this just gets so torturous. It's just such a physiological, uh, I, I don't know, a puzzle that your calf muscles could be literally napalm. They're, they're burning and they're turned to stone yet they can still support your body weight on the front point. It almost doesn't make sense. The amount of pain that they're telling you they hurt this much. Maybe it's like uh, Jan Ulrich, shut up legs, do what I want. <laughs> the, 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 the Tour de France uh, rider. But those, those guys probably have a bunch of stuff helping them not feel the pain, right? I, yeah, should I say that? Yeah, probably. Anyways, <laughs> we're going across here. And any place you can get a foot sideways on a rock or chop out a step, you're just getting a foot sideways and getting the weight off your calf muscle. Finally, in the wee hours, we get into that exit gully and uh, Eric leads us up with two ice axes and Philippe and I second and we have to put our finger into one of the pock holes of Eric's ice axe placements to keep our balance to get the other ice axe in. And we get onto the summit at midnight and, you know, we just... Yeah, we just hugged each other and we howled and we cried a bit. It was just such a beautiful ascent. Finally, you know, the Emperor face of Robson in winter conditions. And the boys named root infinite patience in deference to the fact that I had been so patient putting up this route and had made seven or eight attempts to put this route up. And we bivouacked just down from the summit. And then the next day we went up and got some summit shots. And uh, I measured on the map the mountain I could see in the north relative to the south, 200 miles of visibility. You have to fly in an aircraft to get that kind of visibility. And here we are, terrestrial uh, strivers getting that kind of visibility, summit of the king. So we still got to get down. We go down the south-southwest ridge route, uh, originally climbed by Conrad King in 1924 with the Alpine Club of Canada. And Philippe, he has this device from the Alps, this Fifi hook, this big Fifi hook with a bungee on it. And he calls it the hook. And you put the hook on the anchor and you can repel on one rope and then jiggle and the hook release from the anchor. And you only need one rope or you can tie two ropes together and do, uh, you know, 120 meter rappel rather than 60 meter rappel. So we come to this Serac, we have to rappel over it. And, you know, I'm making a Belikoff anchor and Philippe says to me, do you want to use the hook? And I go, Philippe, why would I want to use the hook? I have two ropes. <laughs> I will put two ropes through the anchor. <laughs> so I don't think I ever did use the hook. <laughs> so they have modern stuff now that I still haven't used. The escaper is one of the things that's out there. And then you get down to the Swartz ledges, the black ledges. And you want to run across the black ledges because it is threatened by a significant amount of overhead Serac threat. And in uh, justification of the route that Kane opened, you know, in the summertime without snow on here, I uh, guided through here once and my client and my uh, practicum guide and myself, we ran across here. It's a flat sidewalk. It, it literally looks like a piece of laid sidewalk. We ran through there and we're out from under those Seracs five to 10 minutes, probably closer to the five minute side. You, you don't dally there. Coming across in winter time, once you hit the fall zone, you run across there. And that's Erica coming, Eric coming across as third man. And uh, yeah, we all got through there pretty efficiently. Be hard to get through there with that kind of snow cover with a guest unless they had really good ability. Kane, when he was there in the summer of 24, 
He actually guided Phyllis Munday, the first woman to climb Mount Robson via these black ledges and said very intelligently to her, if you hear a crack, you lie down, lie down and get close. You might have a chance of survival lying against one of the little vertical steps uh, on this sidewalk. The Serac debris might thunder over top of you. Um, yeah, yeah, spooky place in mountaineering, don't waste time. And even though Philippe is not wasting time here, he's running down, you're no longer threatened here. That's actually doesn't threaten this summit of Little Robson, a 10,300 foot sub peak. Um, and here's part of the Keynes route of, uh, man, 1916. Very first ascent of Robson, the traverse from the Kane face on the other side over to the roof. And uh, yeah, 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 the Forester Hut, where we got down there, it had snowed. So I knew the terrain below the Forester Hut with this snake snot covering of, you know, a foot of new greasy, slimy snow was going to be like, the worst experience you could imagine in the mud season in Vietnam or something. And we were going to go down a lot. We were going to slide and it was going to be spooky. So I got out my radio. It was a Sunday and I got on Yellowhead helicopters frequency. And I said, climbers on Mount Robson for Yellowhead helicopters. And uh, my buddy, Todd Cooper, who was flying with them now, he's now the base manager here with Alpine helicopters. He said, wow, Barry, what's going on? I said, Todd, do you think you could fly up to the forest or hut and pick us up? And he goes, oh, I'm cleaning my house. But yeah, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> you know, basically an hour later, Todd came in with the helicopter and flew us down to the Denison pit. And uh, that was the uh, end of the ascent of infinite patience. And this is a shot of the upper reaches of the emperor and the north face taken from dog buttress. And recently uh, used in uh, Hawthorne and his partner who, God, this sucks for not forgetting names. So I'll apologize in advance because I've just been talking with these guys. Just recently put a route up over here. And Infinite Patience is just on the other side, I think, of this rib. And then Steve House was able to go back with Colin Haley and put a route up very close, shared some of the terrain that the first ascent was Mug Stumps and uh, Jim Logan, um, uh, Jamie Logan uh, in the late 70s uh, made, you know, a great, great ascent. And before an attempt by Kanzler and Pat, uh, oh man, Pat's a hero of mine, lives in Bozeman, Montana, and uh, kicking myself for not being able to remember his name right now. I think he told me a story about having to get over this edge here to escape the face and taking a number of falls and bending a ice screw every time and having to replace it. So a lot of history, Pat Callis, Pat Callis, who, you know, Pat must be, Pat's in his eighties. Last time I saw him ice climb a decade ago, he climbed perfectly, didn't miss a beat, just artist. So hang in there y'all. <laughs> Me too. So um, that is it. And I don't see any questions coming my way. So um, if there isn't any questions, I can look in the chat. I think I can look in the chat if the computer will treat me right. Yeah, nothing in there. So thank you all for showing up. And uh, yeah, if you enjoyed it, share it with other other friends, get them to watch it. And uh, yeah, yeah, we're, we're done. See you sometime in the future in the mountains. Take care.